Are we ready to get started again? We've got maybe a couple more people drifting in, but while they're drifting in, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Jessica Linvar. Jessica is um, the Elixir National Node Coordinator for training, um, and, uh, and, and she also coordinates bioinformatics training nationally within, w within Sweden, outside of the Elixir context, if I've, if I've understood this correctly. Um, she's part of a group that's been working on, on a mastery rubric for, for bioinformatics, and she's going to tell us more about it. Over to you, Jessica. Okay, do you hear me like that? Okay, right. Okay, so thank you so much for this possibility to present to you uh, the work that uh, me and uh, the other girls on this slide has uh, worked upon in two years' time now, approximately. So uh, it's not only me, it's also Rochelle Trachtenberg, who is a cognitive scientist statistician from the States, and we have Terry Atwood and Ella Gravia, and then also myself, we are the bioinformaticians in these kind of settings in this team. So I'm really excited to share this work with you today. And as the talk is rather short, it's only 20 minutes, I hope to get your curiosity kind of spark to, to um, go to the speaker, uh, my, my attendee, my speaker profile in the conference app and read the paper, the preprints that is now out on peer review for PLOS One. It's also handouts for the poster that was presented yesterday, and it's also another kind of handout that is more information about the poster or, or uh, of the rubric. Um, so this is anyway the outline of my talk. Uh, and also the, the slides for this talk is on the speaker profile that you can download. So I would like to present to you or go through the common problems that we all have when it comes to development of courses and curricula. And this is instructional problems, more or less independent of the topic that you are uh, dealing with in, in your design. I will then, and it will be brief, it will not go in depth at all. I will try to give you an outline what the master rubric for bioinformatics is and also try to show you that how this master rubric for biomatics solved these instructional problems previously then go through. So just a quick kind of introduction to our jargon. So these are words that you are going to be seeing when you're reading the paper for master rubrics or master rubrics for bioinformatics. And at least I would assume that some of these words are well familiar to the audience being bioinformaticians or in that kind of field. And others are maybe not in the vocabulary at all. At least I know for me, when I got introduced into the train the trainer programs for Elixir and also started this work with the master rubric, some of the words did not exist in my vocabulary. So it's a totally different field of education learning that has merged for me for bioinformatics. So it's really a mind blower. So what is then the problems that we are facing when it comes to, to curriculum design and both for, for full semester courses and also short courses? So looking at this, it's I think one, two, three, eight uh, common problems in instructional designs. And Thinking of these problems, it's something we should all be aware of these problems when designing something. We should address these problems. And even if we can't address all of them successfully, I think it's important that we are aware of them. We should be aware that we need to identify the target audience. We usually, even if we are not thinking of the problem per se in the words, we are usually anyway doing that in some ways specifying prerequisites, so we are trying to, to get the kind of best audience towards the, the target of the course that we want. And then, of course, articulating learning outcomes. Maybe that is the most one to highly kind of emphasize that everything stems from learning outcomes. And then we're all the way down to evaluating the teaching, as well as assessing the learning, both during the course, during the 
sessions that you are having, but also after, after the course. So what is then the master rubrics for bioinformatics? We believe that this could be a tool to address common problems, these common problems that you have in course and curriculum design. And I don't know how well you know about master rubrics in a general sense, but they are overwhelming. They are massive, they are heavy, they are huge, usually because it's a, they are huge. It feels like it anyway. So here I, I will use a word you should never ever use in training and teaching, and I will use it because it's demeaning, you should never use it, but I will use it in the concept of trying to de-dramatize the whole, the sense of a master rubric. And it's just a table. It's just a 3D table, it's a matrix that, that, that you can use in order to try to fit yourself or, or an individual uh, it, it in, in a way. So, so let's see if I can guide you through uh, the master rubric for bioinformatics. So on the left-hand side here, right, right, left-hand side, you have the knowledge, skills, and abilities. Uh, I will I will discuss them a bit more in a while, and uh, then you have the stages on the top, and the stages are the developmental trajectory from which someone is less expert and going to be a more expert. And it's important to notice that this is, it has no time frame in these stages, but it is a developmental thing, that you start from somewhere and you go to somewhere. And then, which took the definite the most time to, uh, to work on in this work was the performance level descriptors, the PLDs. And these are the ones, uh, the, the cells that goes to any case save, to any given stage, and it describes the performance at that stage. And that um, is in the table that also gives it the hugeness of the table. So, with regards to the uh, 12 identified uh, KSAs that goes to, uh, to um, with the master rubric for bioinformatics. Um, let's say it like this. We, we started off with the seven kind of core KSAs that goes to the scientific uh, method. And then we mapped that, those to the competencies, uh, both the Welsh and Kulikowski AMIA and competencies. And we have now developed it into 12 different uh, KSAs that we believe is sufficient uh, to, to map a bioinformatician. So on the top, on the more light uh, pink, you have the prerequisite knowledge in biology and the prerequisite knowledge of uh, computational methods, which are kind of the core KSAs coming to the, from, to the bioinformatics, so to speak. Whereas the more darker shade of uh, pink are more topic independent in that sense. And one might, might argue maybe that like the in interdisciplinary integration, you need that of course as it's bioinformatics. It's collaborative by nature, it's a team science area, et cetera, et cetera. So the stages then. So I, I said that the stages was something that you, you took someone from less expert to more advanced, more expert. And just to give you a kind of a brief uh, description of each level is that we believe that a novice is someone that remembers, understands, can engage with well-defined problems with known solution. And we pictured this as an early uh, undergrad new to bioinformatics uh, individual. Also to say that the stages are built upon the Bloom's taxonomy. Uh, we are uh, thinking of um, in the hierarchical and developmental sets. It's the Bloom's taxonomy that is, uh, and also the, uh, uh, yeah. Mm. Uh, we then have the beginner. It's someone that can understand and apply. So they engage with well-defined problems uh, and apply, but what they are told to apply. So no critical thinking yet, right? And this is a late undergrad, early masters, what we believe. Then we come to the apprentice levels, someone who's choosing and applying. Um, and that 
choosing and applying uh, techniques to problems that have been defined to them, and that's master's level doctoral students. And here is, uh, I will take both of them at the same time here. So, journeyman is sometimes used as like the end state for, for certain things. But when we, are, when we were defining all of this, we saw the need that we needed to have divide these two into a, a early and, and a late journeyman. And you see by the description why we thought that. So early journeyman is just the er uh, earliest kind of evidence uh, establishment of independent expertise. So here is an individual that uh, now starts to be independent, are independent, like seeing it as a, taking the driver's license. You know how to drive when you get your driver's license, but you really don't have experience to drive. You need that further, right? Uh, whereas the late journeyman then is independent and expert in specific life science area. Uh, adaptable and creative. So you have the higher, highest Bloom's level. So you have the Bloom's level five and six in those. So late, and, and, and throughout the talks in the education thing is, is that we should remember that looking at the, for instance, a PhD structure is different from all the countries. So these are just examples, what we have discussed as. So a PhD student in the Swedish community might not be uh, the same placed in this rubric as uh, someone from, I don't know, Germany or something. Okay, so the performance levels descriptors. Again, these are the ones that we spend a lot of time on. And I got really, really, really good feedback yesterday uh, regarding how these were kind of, um, described, and we all know in the teacher training kind of community, we should not use negative, what did you, what did you call it, Patricia, negative wordings, yes, negative wordings, and, and that is uh, true. Uh, so this is something I, I take back to the team and see that should we leave it blank, should we an X, or should we have different uh, tables for if it's needing to be, needed to be something, maybe for the instructor, etc. Uh, so, so anyway, so, so the performance levels descriptors describe performance at, at any given stage. So the example highlighted here is then the prerequisite knowledge computational methods. And seeing that, that for a novice is that basic knowledge uh, of the computational method all the way down then to the independence and the creative description of, of what we believe an individual is. Um, so we believe that the master rubric of bioinformatics can help when it comes to uh, solving these common instructional problems. And I will try to outline how we see that, what, what in the rubrics will help for the different problems. And I also want to say this while I remember that, that so I said that th this paper is out on review. and. Hopefully, if it is accepted and, and printed, you do not need to use this as a tool if you have preference for other things. But we would like you to take with you the way we have set up this, the method, how what we used uh, going about thinking about these master rubrics, that is supported with cognitive tasks analysis and the scientific methods, etc. Uh, and uh, as, and we think that having this work peer reviewed also give us the chance to get the feedback from the community. And it doesn't stop there. The comments from you now, from now on, is also important because it, this is a living thing, right? So we want it to be used and or useful in some ways. So again, here are then the uh, first four common problems listed previously. And on the left side you have for the curriculum uh, design, what you should think of and use it. And on the other side is the short courses. And it's, that's, this is a quite a short talk. I will focus on the, let's see now, the right hand, um, that was my plan anyway, the right hand side for the standalone training course. Uh, I'm coming from a community where we, that is what we are doing. We are planning standalone short courses. However, I've heard a lot of talks in these sessions on the other side with the curricula. So uh, I'm sorry for to those guys that I'm not going into details for those. Okay. So anyway, 
we all know the problem with identifying the target uh, audience. And here we believe that the stages, so from novice to late journeyman, uh, allows instructors as well as learners to place themselves. So this is a mastery rubric, it's a table that should be used both by instructors and learners, and also maybe simultaneously together uh, in order to place uh, the individual. And uh, my kind of homework to you, or, or my challenge to you, is that read the paper and place yourselves in these cases, uh, if you are bioinformaticians. And see if that follows your developmental trajectory and where you want to be. Uh, so, specifying prerequisite, we believe that the performance level descriptors there can be used to describe the prerequisites uh, for, uh, needed to succeed in order to have a success in the, in the course that you are providing. The learning outcomes, again, I can't stress this enough, and you know this, that it's, everything stems from the learning outcomes. Uh, and here, the, again, the PLDs support realistic learning outcomes because we all know that we want to push, always want to push more into a course than maybe it's not realistic, right? So the rubric can help you to, to really just keep your goals realistic in that sense, given the time and prerequisite that you already. The poster talked about that yesterday. I didn't know, I don't know if you noticed that, that if you have the learning outcomes, you go to the next stage and you do something, and if you're not meeting that criteria, you go back and redo. So it's like a, it's a flow chart of that. So, so download the poster and have a look again if you missed that. So select an in-class activity. Time in class can focus on one KSA and PLD. And uh, ensuring content coverage. This is also something, uh, again, due to time and also due to the other problems that stated uh, in the previous slide. Fixed KSAs and PLDs mean same structure can be used across content area. We believe that the mastery rubric, we know it's general in the sense, but it's intended to be general, although specific, because it has the specific PLDs in it. Um, yeah. So managing planning time, plan your time to, do, to, uh, to lead to KSAs and target PLD achievement. And as uh, I learned in one of the train the trainer, and I think that goes hand in hand with this kind of common instructional problem, is that teach what, you, what is most important first in the class, because you do not know how much time you will have, and also uh, you are more likely to remember what you are told first. <laughs> so the learning is like that. Assess learning. This is something we should do during course, after course, any time. We do that just, I do that now, just looking at you. Do you seem to have question marks in your faces or not, uh, etc. Uh, so we think that the PLDs here can uh, focus on assessment on what learners should be able to demonstrate. Again, looking at the rubrics where you had placed yourself and, and the course. And as we have talked about and heard from many talks, is that evaluation of teaching, that is quite hard. It's really hard in the sense of uh, how to do a survey, how should you evaluate, what is the best way. And this is, I, I guess, is another research field all by its own, uh, how to do a good survey. Uh, and we should make use of, uh, for instance, uh, Sarah's and the EBI's, all the efforts that they have done, what can we learn from that, what can we take, so we're not reinventing the wheel, I guess. So the rubric, the master rubric for bioinformatics here can promote targeted follow-up, for instance, that did you uh, move on beyond the, the learning outcomes uh, that was stated, etc. <coughs> so with this, I hope that I, in some way, spark curiosity, at least to read the paper critically, please, and then come back to, to any of us, uh, or all of us, and uh, we would like this to be used in some ways, part of it, or something anyway for, for the community to, to uh, something anyway, <laughs> would be nice. <laughs> Thank you. And again, if you have questions, please use the microphone because we're being recorded. Uh, 
even if I presented, it was overwhelming, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, but please come back with question. If you don't have it now, we can have it. Um. I have a question, so thank you for the presentation. Uh, have you, has there been any discussion so far about the relationship, uh, potential relationship between the mastery rubric and then also some of the other work that we just saw in Nikki's talk earlier, uh, with it, whether we talked about the bioinformatics competencies or uh, the different personas, if people already started thinking about is, is, is there any relationship that people need to think about those two things? Do we need to think about them separately? Uh, I'm just curious what, what discussions have had so, that so I've, I've missed. No, no, so the discussions regarding that within the team is that so from the beginning we worked on, we took the cases and we tried to match them to the competencies. Uh, personally, I believe that the competencies are, I mean, they are great. Uh, they are uh, two, two, these are two different, this stems from two different kind of questions from originally and, and, and it, not over all questions, but in the sense of what, how they can be used and they can be used together in, in my, in my, what I, what I think. <laughs> so again, what I think. Um, so we believe that this master rubric coming to the persona say, I would say, Maybe no, but more on a true individual. But with that said, maybe I got the personas wrongly. So the personas should be an individual, right? Mm. Yeah. Or? Representative <laughs> of a group of individuals. Yeah. So, so what we are working on a bit now in order also to clarify further the master rubric for biomatic how to be used. We need examples so people can more easily understand this more general table or matrix that is being used. But we want this to be uh, something that the whole community, independent of what framework you would like to work in or work with, why not, why not pick the raisins of both? In, in a way. I mean, it, it, it's not impossible. I can't see that anyway. No. Um, I have a question and a comment. Thanks a lot for the presentation. And one thing that I still miss, I don't know what it is, what is a mastery rubric as itself? So I, I, I'm still, I don't know. I have tried to look for the if this and then I don't know what it is. So I don't know if I'm I'm the best one to answer <laughs> that one, if I should uh, uh, get that back to Rochelle. But mm. to me, the master rubric is more or less that you have a set of knowledge, skills, and abilities. You mm. have stages, which can mm. be different of uh, the, the research kind of community or which level okay. you are in. So you could have novice up to master or novice up to, but you have the stages and then you have the KSAs for, mm -hmm. for your topic or field, and then you have performance levels descriptors in that, that are uh, typical for that field. My other, my, maybe a, a comment also, because I also had the same question as, as Jason, is that I, I, the way I see it also, I think that the, the competences and the mastery rubrics they feed well together. In is maybe you're looking in different perspectives to the same object. Yeah. And yeah, so yeah. It's, they can definitely be aligned in a so way at some about, point for yeah. personas or for individuals. Thinking or, about this yeah. also, if if one thinks of this as more general, I mean, it's too general. It's not content mm. specific in the rubric. It's not because the ch uh, like Jason spoke of yesterday, the field changed so quickly. So it is designed so we are not have to revise it. We should not have to do that, B but we should be able with the performance levels descriptor to anyway uh, do the job, so to speak. We could anyway do the curriculum design or the trajectory development. But with the support then maybe of the personas or the competencies, to, to under, I mean, to strengthen, mm -hmm. to put more detailed, I don't know, something like that, maybe. So, so my, my, my personal feeling about this, which I, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna try and unpick in my introduction to the next section, and forgive me, because I'll be doing it on the fly, which is not something I'm very good at. But my, my perception is that the competency framework brings in the employer's mm -hmm. kind of thinking, and how do I 
ensure that someone is fit to perform this role and, and, and to grow in that role? How do I then develop them when they're in that role? So I, I, there's lots of overlap, but mm -hmm. I, I think, I, I think th your viewpoint that we're looking at the same problem from slightly different perspectives is, mm -hmm. is exactly how I see it. But one has perhaps a little bit more the employer's hat on, the other one has more the educational psychology hat on. Mm -hmm. But isn't that a good thing? Yes, absolutely. To get absolutely. That, 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 that's, that's a good thing. So, one, oh. one more question, and then I think yes. probably just a quick question. I was wondering about any condensed framework for possibly a boot camp for students who are transitioning to bioinformatics. I, I, I was just thinking about the different talks that people have made in terms of, the, you know, moving from one stage to the next. And I, I have a number of students who aren't at a level that you were mentioning in terms of prerequisites. So I was wondering if you thought about, you know, minimal competencies for, for students moving into bioinformatics. I mean, that's just a yeah, yeah, no, so, 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 it, so, so the thing is that with, again, so maybe I'm not the best one to answer these things again, but, but the master rubric uh, would help you to then define the minimal requirements or minimal kind of competencies. That you that you would need uh, for that, but maybe I did not understand the full. I, yes, I think please, Jason. The only reason I can give a comment is because I talk endlessly with Rochelle about <laughs> this to also try to understand it myself. For me, the key thing is this uh, thing that was mentioned: the performance level descriptor, which is what behavior. Uh, if we have a if we have our boot camp or we have a workshop. The, th the thing that you need to figure out is what behavior can the learner demonstrate in order to show that they have reached this particular mm. level for this knowledge, skill, or ability. Mm. So what the, the mastery rubric does, it's so general, but then for your particular case, you need to work out what are the performance level descriptors so that you could say, okay, now if I want to take that rubric and apply it to microscopy, and I want to teach you about microscopy, although wouldn't be the bioinformatics mastery rubric, mm -hmm. it would be microscopy rubric. You could figure out, uh, in my particular course, here's what you need to do to show. And because all of these things have been aligned to Bloom's, then mm. you also get the idea of uh, where are we at. Because the mistake that happens, why the boot camps and workshops are not successful, is because essentially uh, m many boot camps and workshops just assume that somehow you'll make it from Bloom's one level one to yes. Bloom's level five and that without is actually transitioning a mm. learner through each one of mm. those. Mm. So it assumes that somehow mm. there's a quantum mm. leap where, you, where the learner will end up somewhere where you've never placed them. So you get the frame. Yeah. You so get, I mean, you have, yeah. this is so the frame the you are So the rubric helps mm. you to know where the milestone should mm. be mm. And, and that you can check off that you're passing through them. And if you can't, if you only have this much time, then guess what? Your learners with you mm. will only get to level three or mm. level four. Mm. So I think Because that's it's, it's so us. easy to get the cognitive overload when we are doing courses. And, 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 and we do it because we are kind, because we, th we want to give so much of ourselves and the knowledge. Yes. Maybe we should ask a quick question of the audience. Who in the room has never put too much in a course? <laughs> it's, it's the learners that show up that don't have <laughs> I think I got the result I wanted there. <laughs> thank you so much for Well, let's thank Jessica again for a very thought-provoking talk. <laughs>